either a boy or a girl. God's a combination of that. But, but sometimes I call God my mummy and sometimes I call God my daddy. So who's your daddy? God, God is your dad, actually. That's who's your dad. And who's your mum? God's your mum, you see. God's, God's, my, God's your mum's mum, too. So your mum is actually your sister. <laughs> Did you know that? that God's, <laughs> yeah, mum's your re- sister, really. <laughs> she is. Yeah, Because from God's perspective, you think about it from God's perspective, he is you and you're, you're, in, a, you're in a skirt at, yep, skirt at the moment, so you right, dress like that. Mummy in a skirt. No, mummy's in shorts, so we dress mummy like this. So here's mummy at the moment. She's in shorts. All right. All right. Just don't think that's a male, that's a girl. All right. But both of you are children of God. So God has two children. So those two children have to be sisters. So you and your mum are sisters from God's perspective, right? You see, and and when mummy treats you like she's your mummy and not your sister, then mum's out of line. (laughs) Does that make sense? Yeah. She's just an older sister to you, so therefore she knows a bit more. And sometimes you can listen to her and sometimes you don't have to because if sometimes you'll listen to her and she's telling you lies or untruths and sometimes she'll listen to her and she's telling you truth, right? Sorry, Mummy, but that is true. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I know, yeah. And so what we have to do is we have to think about what, what Mummy needs to think about and Mummy's doing this right now. Mummy needs to think about what does God want me to teach you, my little sister? That's how Mummy's seeing it, you see. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what she's doing is trying to teach you things that she had to learn the hard way. And it's good if you can learn things the easy way rather than the hard way. Yeah. 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 But so God is male and female. You can think of masculine and feminine all together as one unit. So God's neither male nor female. But God has masculine and feminine qualities. So you know how sometimes you like wearing a dress... Well, was, well, you think that God sometimes like wearing a dress too. <laughs> right? But you know how sometimes you like wearing shorts? Yeah. yeah. Well, you think God sometimes likes wearing shorts too? I sometimes like to wear long pants. You wear, like to wear long pants? Yeah. Sometimes. Well, God sometimes likes that too. Yeah? Everything that we like, at some point, God has liked it. Except when it's out of harmony with love. Because God always does things that are loving. That's the thing to remember about God. Does that make sense? Yeah. How's that with your questions? Is that it? You have two more to go. No worries. Let's go from. How are we God's children? Just like I said. Does that make sense? Well, actually, let's describe it in a little bit more detail, right? So you can think of this ball of energy up here is God, right? With masculine and feminine qualities. And you could think what God, and you could call this a soul. So God is, in fact, the spirits in the spirit world, right? Our high up spirits in the spirit world call God the great oversoul. And then God created all these little miniature souls. Right? You can think of all these little miniature souls, and you're one half of one of them. Right? So you're one half of one of these miniature souls, and God created billions and billions of those souls. And I still don't know how many of those souls God created. And those souls are God's children. As to how God did it, I'm hoping that God will teach me that one day. Because I'd like to do it one day. I'd like to be able to do the same thing. Why does my tummy hurt all the time? Why does your tummy hurt all the time? Where is your tummy hurting? Can you tell me where? Up here? Right, so it's right above your belly button, isn't it? Yeah. All right. It's hurting because mummy's not dealing with some fear. Mummy's afraid and your tummy's hurting because of it. Does that make sense? Yes. So what's happening is that mum, what mummy needs to do is allow herself to feel some of the terror that, she's, that she feels. And when she, feels, when she allows herself to feel that terror, your tummy will stop hurting here. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Yeah. And you can notice it. You can know. You know how some days your tummy doesn't hurt, and other yes. days your tummy does hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you just ask mummy. Are you feeling afraid again today, mummy? You do that. That'll help her out. Okay. All right. So every time your tummy hurts, you just say, Mummy, you must be feeling afraid again. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. What happens in your body is, that, is that when your body hurts, a lot of the things that happen to your body are because things that Mummy and or Daddy are, are stopping from happening in themselves. And so what happens inside of your body is your body reacts. And sometimes what happens in your body is that you have some spirits around you who have the same thing going on with you too. The key is to let yourself feel about it at any time and you'll be able to know what it is. So I know some, some children who tell their mummies, mummy you're angry again or mummy you're sad again or whatever and you're not feeling it and that can help mummy and daddy quite a lot to deal with their stuff. And that's the end of your questions. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's your questions? Um, I just wanted to know if I was like, um, say, sixteen, yeah. and um, I knew about the um, the spirit world and Summerland, yeah. and I wanted to go there, so I committed suicide. Yeah. Would I still go to Summerland? No. All right. I'll Didn't think so. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you what's happening. You see, there are some laws that God has about love. And one of the laws is about love of yourself. Yeah. Now, when you learn about the laws of love, you start realising that some of these laws are actually based around how you love yourself, how you love other things, and how you love God, mm -hmm. if you think about it that way. So if God gave you a gift of life, would it be right for you then to take it away? Probably not. Can, can you create life yourself? Mm, I don't know. Have you ever, uh, like, have you ever built a, a cardboard animal and then it turned into a live animal? No. No, okay. So it's really hard for you to create life, isn't it? Yeah. And imagine how hard it is for you to create your own life. Yeah. That would be pretty hard, wouldn't it? Yeah. So do you think it's right then for you to take it away? No. No. See, a lot of times what happens, though, is that we're ha not having a very fun life on Earth, right? So we go along, we learn about the spirit world and then we start going like, well, you know, if I know about the spirit world and I know about Summerland and I know there's all these really wonderful things going there, sometimes I start having the thought that I'd like to get away from this life and go and have a nice new life up there, right? Sometimes I think that. But the problem is in doing that, I'd be breaking some of God's laws of love towards myself and laws about life. And in doing that, I won't arrive necessarily in Summerland I will arrive in different places of the spirit world that are a lot darker than Summerland and not as nice. And I will stay in that place until I work through the reason, the emotional reason why I decided to kill myself. Does that make sense? Would someone go to Summerland if they committed suicide except they were only like six? Um, they would still have some emotions to work through. Yeah. So what would happen if they were six is they would get a spirit, there would be a lovely spirit come along and they'd grab you and take you in their arms and they'd give you a hug and everything and then they'd, then they'd help you work through the emotional reason why you don't wanted to die, <laughs> right? And they'll stay with you for as long as it takes for you to work through why. And then once you work through why and you release all of that emotion, <laughs> then you'll be able to do whatever you want in Summerland and, and any other locations. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um. so it's never a good idea to commit suicide ever. Does that make sense? And um, if you really desired to die, but you didn't, you knew that it's not good to commit suicide. Yeah. Would your um, law of attraction bring that to you? Yes, it could do, and that's why it's always good to work through the desire to die. Does that mm. make sense? So, so um, a lot of times, a lot of times, I've spoken in the past about if a person desires something, it's almost the same as if they've done it, right? So we still need to work through why we want to do it. So with, let's say I wanted to die. What I would have to do is work out why am I so sad or so unhappy that I want to die and let myself actually have a cry about what's going on inside of me. Have you seen mum crying a bit? Like yeah. Last? yeah. 
So what she's doing is she's working her way through some of the emotional reasons of why she wants to do different things. Yeah. Does that make sense? And when you release those emotional reasons, you don't want to do them anymore. Mm. Right? Right. Um, also, a question that I had at the start was, how did you die in the first century? Well, there was the issue with truth and error, right? Mm. When you st tell the truth to everybody, a lot of people get angry. Yeah. Did you notice that sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, a friend at school comes up and says, oh, did you tell such and such something? And you go, yeah, and then they get angry with you because they yeah. might have got hurt by whatever they said or whatever. Mm. Um, and in the first century, that happened to me all the time, where I'd go up, people would come up to me and they'd say, and, and they'd say, oh, could you tell me my emotions or could you tell me why I, I can't connect with God? And so I'd just say, no worries, I'll tell you. So I told them and, and then they got, got really angry, angry, they really angry with me, injury. right? Yeah. And then eventually what happened is that there was a whole group of people who had all of this money, right? And they started feeling that if I kept teaching what I was teaching, and what I was teaching was that everyone was equal and that everyone could love each other and also that there were principles and laws, and if I kept teaching what I was teaching, they would have lost all their money. And so they got very angry with me and they all met together and they decided that the only way out was for them to kill me. Right. And, and that's why I died. Yeah. Um, and um, at churches, how the preachers, they tell not the truth. Um, yep. Like, <laughs> um, mum told me that um, they said that if they didn't pay the church money, that their children would um, not go to heaven, yep. or they would not go to heaven. Why did they do that? Well, it, um, they did it for a lot of reasons. You know, when a, when a child dies, yeah. a lot of parents get really distraught. Yeah. Have you seen that? Like, yeah. you, know, you see how sad they get and they mm. get very sad. And so what happens then is people are afraid about a child dying. Yeah. Because they, they're afraid of feeling all of that terrible sadness. So they protect them. So they try to protect the child. And so now people who are not so nice can leverage money or other things out, out of the parent. Do you know what I mean by leverage? Yeah. What they do is they say something to the parent in order to get the parent to protect the child when the parent doesn't even need to do that. Right? Yeah. And so what happens a lot of times historically is that people who are in positions of power tell parents if your child dies it's going to get stuck in limbo for example and then the parent says what can I do, what can I do, I don't want my child stuck in limbo, what can I do? Oh well if you pay some money I'll help the child get out of limbo. So now the parent pays the money, do you see? So a lot of times it's because of blackmail. You've heard of blackmail? Yeah. Yeah, when somebody's trying to get something from you and this, they tell you a whole story that's a lie yeah. in order to get it from you. And that's often what happened with religion. And a mm. lot of religion has done that in the past. Right. Yeah. Um, there was another question that you might not be able to tell me, but yeah. I was wondering if um, my dad, my mum and dad are soulmates? Well, I might be able to tell you it, but I'm not going to. Right? Because there's something really important about it and that is it's very important that mums and dads and, or any, and you too, when, that you feel your own feelings about who your soulmate and who isn't. Because it's a wonderful process to work your way through and resolve the question yourself. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's not really a question that somebody else can answer for you in a way that's going to be satisfying for you in terms of your feelings. <laughs> so why are you worried about mum and dad not being soulmates? Well, it's not that I'm work. Well, I guess I am because yeah. I love my mum and dad yeah. and I don't want them to split up. Right. So that's something that all children need to work their way through, you see. What, what yeah. we all need to work our way through is that when we're worried about something, that means that we're afraid of feeling some grief. Mm -hmm. Now, if your mummy still loves you yeah. and your daddy still loves you, mm -hmm. does it really matter who they're with? Not really. Not really, does it? as long as they still love you and care for you and, yeah. sh and show you love and all those things. And it's not really matter, it doesn't really matter who they live. So if mummy at some point in the future decides that daddy's not a soulmate or whatever, yeah. then, then in the end of the day, that, as long as mummy and daddy both love you mm. and they don't use you against each other, yeah. then they're still being loving to you <laughs> and everything's going to be fine for you still. Okay. Um, just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, does, because there's soulmates, does 
basically everyone meet their soulmate in their life because the um, attraction. Yeah, everyone can meet their soulmate in their life and a lot of people do, but they don't even know who their soulmate is a lot of times. Yeah. Because they take one look at it and say, oh, he's a bit ugly, I don't think I'll go for him, right? <laughs> and they don't realise they're not seeing their soul, they're just seeing the physical body. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a lot of times what happens is that we meet our soulmate even when we're very young, but <laughs> we don't know. And it's not until later on that we work through things emotionally that we finish up knowing who is or who isn't. Yeah, okay. So you could meet your soulmate when you're 10. All right? You could easily do that. You can, people can meet the soulmate when they're 10, when they're 15, when they're 20. But it all depends on what happens in terms of what, what emotions are in you, whether you like him or not, or her or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it could be a him or a her. So... Yeah, she's got one more question. Um, can your um, can can your um, soulmate be um, the same as you? Like, say, if I, I'm a female, yep. um, would my can my soulmate be a female? Yes, your soulmate can be a female, and if you're a male, your soulmate could be a male, mm -hmm. and or, so it could be e either gender. So it can be a male or a female. And you won't know until you work through different things, you won't know for certain which it is. And then as you work through different emotions, what happens is you know for certain. So you, when you, sometimes you get to your teens and you start feeling, mm, I know for certain, you know, who, what my soulmate's, what gender is. But you see, sometimes too, we have a lot of emotional injuries from our childhood sometimes, where, you know, mummy hurt us or daddy hurt us. And so we don't want our soulmate to be like my daddy, so we decide that we want our soulmate to be... A, and it's not a decision like that. It's not based about the hurt in the past. And what we've been encouraging all of the parents here to do is to release their emotional hurts from their past. And that way, once they do that, all of their children will automatically know whether their soulmates are male or a female. Does that make sense? There's one more. <laughs> once you start asking questions, it's just hard to stop, eh? Um, what sphere do you have to be into, like fly and teleport and do all those things? Okay, yeah, I think a lot of parents would like to know that one too. <laughs> okay. Well, firstly, being in the eighth sphere doesn't guarantee that you automatically know how to teleport or to fly, all right? Because there's a whole lot of spiritual laws that you have to learn to do it. So. But being in the eighth sphere means that you can learn those spiritual laws very rapidly. So there's a big difference there. And also, there are some things that God does in order to... Like, for you, if you imagine you became the first person who could teleport, what would everybody else think of you? Well, yeah, you might get the science, scientists all getting there and say, all right, we're going to study this person, right? So what they do is throw you in a cage, dissect you up, check out all of your, uh, you know, all of your genetic code, they call it, and, and they'd work, you know, work out why you can do it, right? In the end, they wouldn't be able to work out anything from that. But anyway, they'd still try to do it sometimes. So at the moment, what happens is that if certain things happen, like somebody could fly or someone could teleport and they could do it all the time, what would happen is a lot of the people on the planet would start to get worried, right, wouldn't they? Could, yeah, they'd think all sorts of things. So, so what's going to happen is that these gifts won't be given to the earth in terms of a, in a complete way until m people on the earth are ready to accept them without hurting everyone. Does that make sense? So you imagine if a lot of people got the, if a lot of people got the um, ability to fly or to teleport, a lot of people at the moment would go, right, where's the first bank vault? I'll teleport, I'll teleport into the first bank vault, get all the money on a bag, you know, and I'll teleport out of there and then I'll find the next bank vault and I'll do exactly the same thing, right? But that wouldn't be very loving, would it? Right. Exactly. That's a very that's the main point. If you get to the place where you can teleport, you wouldn't want to do things that are disharmonious with love. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> so is it Soul's turn now? You've you've done with your questions now? Cool, awesome. You may not be able to answer this, but I was wondering like what is God? Is he a soul or 
Um, there are, there are, I'm going to do some talks soon about God, about God's nature and qualities and attributes and all those kind of things. And I can give you some brief, brief, uh, some brief stuff about what I know God to be. God, God definitely has character and personality and attributes and qualities because I've experienced many of them and you, you even have experienced some of them. So you know that God, for example, is, is an entity, like not just an energy field but an actual entity. So there are a lot of things that God is that we can actually answer but there's still a lot of things that God is that we can't answer. And the reason why is because there's nobody who's yet advanced enough to know all the answers about God. And when you think about it, we are going to keep on asking questions about God for the rest of our lives and we're still not going to know everything about God. Because if God's an infinite being, which I suspect God is, then it follows that I can't ever find out what an infinite being actually is. Does that make sense? Yes. But I can find out a lot. And so what we'll do in the future is we're going to do some presentations where we, we actually find out a lot about God. So I can tell you things like, like God likes mathematics. How about that? Okay. You don't, but God does. Like, what about uh, God, likes, uh, God likes emotions? We know that for certain because he created as emotional beings. We know that God is all about love because you can see how when we get the most joy in our lives is when we're loving, right? And so we can feel, feel that as well. So, so what happens is that <laughs> what happens is that God has a lot of qualities and attributes that, that we can understand. But there is also a lot about God's nature that we're yet to understand. And the key is allow yourself to investigate it. Because the only way you can investigate God is to actually... <laughs> You're having fun with this, aren't you? <laughs> a lot of the things about God that we, that we do know, we can actually spend a lot of time with God and talk to God and feel God's responses and feel God talking to us. So all of those things can happen. But, but that doesn't mean even if we investigate for the rest of our existence, that we'll ever really know everything there is to know about God. It's a bit like asking yourself, do you know everything you know, there is to know about mum? Like, do you know how her pan crease works? Yeah. I know that's a funny question, but do you know? No. No. Now, you might spend like 10, 10 hours, 15 hours, and you might spend a whole year, you might become a doctor. Do many doctors know how a pan crease works? Yes. No, they don't. Yet, oh, right? The truth is, if you ask a doctor, they don't really know how a pancreas works yet because a lot of times they can, take, you know, they can take different organs out of the body and still the body seems to still work. So what's the point of that organ being in the body? They don't know really, right? Yeah. They know it has a role of some kind, but they don't understand the full extent. Now, you might spend like a thousand years investigating the role of the pancreas, right? Then you'll know how mum's pancreas works. But it doesn't mean you know mum yet, does it? Do you yep. see that? Yes. And it's a bit like that with God too. A lot of times we're investigating qualities of God, but that doesn't mean that we know the whole of God yet. Does that make sense? Yes. But it's not, I don't think it'd be too important to go to huge lengths to find out because we know quite a lot of his laws. Exactly. So, so like I, my passion is to find out everything I can about God. That's always been my passion. <laughs> And all of God's laws that have come to me in terms of what I now know have all been the result of me following that passion of getting to know God. And that's what I meant by if you seek first God, everything else will come to you. So I believe that if you focus your attention on God and getting to know God first, then everything else in your life will happen really well. But a lot of people don't do that and God doesn't expect you to do it. What God, all God wants is for us to learn how to love in the end. And we'll learn how to do that. Even, we can even learn how to love without God to a large degree. But when you do it with God, you can find out a lot f faster, you know? Yeah. Thank you. No worries, Sol. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is, what sphere were you in when you were born in the first century? Um, I was... It's a good question because... Uh, 
there's, a, there's still a lot of memories that I'm working through right now that I can't answer that question very clearly. The feeling that I have at the moment is this, and that is that I wasn't, that when I was born, so the question is not when I was, when, not when I was in the womb of mum, but when I was born. When I was born, I was in the sixth sphere, I feel, at the moment. Now, I feel that happened through a process. Um, now, I'm not certain whether that's true at this point, but that's the feelings that I have. Um, in other words, I was born without what they call, what they call sin. Right? Somebody had to be, because if I was born with sin, I would have ended up exactly the same as anybody else anyway, and uh, then wouldn't have been able to learn all the other things that needed to be learnt, right? And then somebody else like yourself would have had to come along and be born without sin. So somebody had to be at some point. And uh, that's the feeling I have at the moment, but I'm not certain about that. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, say if I had emotion that one of my parents had and they released it, would I still have it? Well, um, it a bit depends on what emotion it is and what's yep. happened and how old you are and a lot of other factors, right? But let's say you were young, young like yep. maybe five years old. Right. Now, if you were five years old and you had an emotion that your parents had, then that emotion will have already entered you. But once your parents release it, it would be very, very easy for you to release it too. Because, you see, when they don't release their emotion, what they're doing is projecting at you not to release yours. And this is why a lot of parents notice when they have a big cry about something, all of a sudden over the next few days their children have a big cry about the same thing. And that's because the parent releasing the emotion lets the child release theirs. But that doesn't mean you have to wait till mum and dad release their emotions, right? Because even at your age, you can do it, do it all yourself and then you don't have to have those emotions even though mum and dad have them. And that's what it was like for me in the first century. So my mum and dad had lots of emotions in the first century that I didn't have because I'd let myself cry when, when something hurt me. Whereas my mum and dad wouldn't let themselves cry. They, they just, you know, they just suck it up and, you know, try hard to not cry. You know, you know you've seen that mum and dad do that sometimes, right? You know, they're just about to cry, but, you know, they don't let that happen. And that used to happen all the time for me in the first century. And so, in the end, what I used to do was just to let myself feel my emotions. So you can still do that. Yeah. And, uh, and the key is to not get somebody else, not blame somebody else for how you feel. Even blame your parents for how you feel. But notice when some mum and dad have something going on for them, notice how it affects you in your body. Because you can tell them, you know, just like I suggested earlier. You can tell, you can tell them what, uh, that you, you know, you're feeling a bit sick in the stomach and something to do with mum, you know, you can feel it's something to do with mum, so tell her. Does that make sense? Yeah. You trust that. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Any other questions? Yep. How does a heart work? How does a heart work? Our heart work. Wow, which heart are you talking about? Because actually... Our heart. Yeah, but you've got two hearts. <laughs> you've got a heart in your physical body, and then there's a heart in your spirit body. Both. <laughs> Both, okay. Well, how do I explain that? Like, <laughs> that's pretty hard to put into layman's terms, that one. Um, Every single, uh, maybe if I can explain how every single organ in your body works. Every single organ in your body has been created for a specific function and purpose. But how it works and operates is totally dependent upon how you are at the soul level. Do you remember I drew this picture before? How you've got a soul and then you've got a body and then you've got another body. Yeah? And the, you're this one, right? <laughs> She's just pointing out she's a lady, so not, not a man. So, yeah, you're this one, right? So you've got a soul, half of a soul, and you've got a body and a body. Now, those two bodies have different organs. They all have organs. Right? And each organ is designed for all sorts of functions. And mankind on Earth at the moment don't know what those functions are a lot of the time. And not, to be frank with you, I can't even remember a lot of the functions how I am now because there's still a lot for me to remember. But what's happening is that these organs all function in such a way to support the soul's connection to the bodies. So in other words, if the soul isn't connected to the body, then the body would die. Right? And it's actually the soul that's the powerhouse of the bodies. And so these organs in the body all just have 
specific physiological functions that enable the soul to connect to the bodies in order for the soul to experience life through the body. And I'm starting to get two out there, aren't I, in this explanation for you. She's getting very distracted now, so it's just like... <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of? But it's not the whole answer because in terms of each organ, you've got literally thousands of organs in each body. Even your skin is an organ, right? What is organs? An organ is like anything in your body that has a function that, if, that, that your body needs to function. All right? So even your skin is an organ, right? It has a function and there's all things. If you didn't have any skin, you know what would happen? Your skin is like a water... You've, you ever heard of a water jacket? Like a, a waterproof jacket? That's what your skin's like. Cause you imagine jumping in the water and all of a sudden your body soaked up all the water. You'd be <laughs> like a great big sponge, right? Like what would happen in the end, you'd, you'd walk out of the water and you'd be carrying around all this water and then, and then imagine what would happen then. You'd have all this water flowing out of you for the next day, you know. You'd be carrying around every water with be footprints and whatever and you'd be having all this water coming out of you. Your skin keeps all a lot of things in and it keeps a lot of things out of you so it's an organ that has a function but I'm not that interested in those things to be frank I'm more interested in this thing here the reason why I'm interested in that is because that tells me everything about everything else so if I focus on dealing with that then I'll all find out about the other things so I'm not a very good quest person to question about the bodies you know, there's people in the spirit world that know heaps more than I know about the bodies. Yeah, yeah heaps more. And some, sometimes you'll be able to talk to them. Like some of them will come to you and have a chat with you about them. You don't want them to talk to you. You don't know how. You'll learn really easily. Your mum talks to them occasionally. She doesn't really know it yet either. Yeah? All right? Is there such thing as we dying but then staying dead? The truth is that you never really die. It's just the body that dies. But you, you know how you're thinking at the moment? And you have different emotions at the moment, right now? And you can see your friends? Well, all of that won't change as soon as you die. It's still going to be the same. You'll still be able to see your friends. You'll still have feelings. You'll still have thoughts. And they'll even be the same kind of thoughts that you still have now. So nothing will change. The only thing that changes is that this particular body is rubbed out. That's, that's the only thing that changed. Right? It's a good system, eh? Because it means if you have an accident and, you, and, and something happens to your body, you're still alive. I reckon that's a good system anyway. So our soul just goes up so into your, heaven? Your soul can never die as far as it's known. And your soul will, your spirit body will automatically be in the spirit world as soon as you disconnect from this body. So you'll still be just as alive as you've ever been. Okay. That'd be good. So dying's nothing to worry about. Okay. Yep. Is there a devil? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> you know why they feel there's a devil? Why? Well, because, see, a lot of times people on earth do bad things, right? Don't they? You see that happening all the time, don't you, sometimes? And not just accidents, but people do really mean things sometimes, right? Don't they? And so what a lot of people wanted to do is they didn't want to take responsibility. Do you know what it means by take responsibility? Yes. Yeah. So they didn't want to take responsibility for going up and bopping someone in the nose. So what they did is they said, oh, the devil made me do it. So they try to blame it on somebody else. That's what I'm saying. And so a lot of times, the, historically what happened was that everybody started thinking, oh, there's so much badness around that what we have to do is blame everybody else for it. Oh, we don't want to blame everybody else for it, so what we finished up doing is we'll blame one person for it. And let's call that one person the devil, but he doesn't even exist. And all through the spirit world in 2,000 years, I've never seen the devil, because the devil doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Is there such thing as hell? Well, you know how sometimes, what do you think of hell as being? Is it hell like a fiery torment place? Is that what you're thinking? Yes, like in cartoons. Like in cartoons. 
Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Like a big devil with a pitchfork there and, <laughs> and all this fire and whatever going on. Yeah, no, it's not like that. But there are some spirit places in the spirit world that are really dark and everybody there is really nasty. Right? And that's in the bottom of the first sphere. That's right down at the bottom of the first sphere. But if we're in a condition of love, we'll never ever go there. It's only if we're in a, in a bad condition where we want to hurt other people all the time that we'll go there. So if you have a feeling inside of you that you want to hurt somebody, what you've got to do is get to the sadness that you feel about it. Does that make sense? Yes. Rather than wanting to hurt somebody. Okay. And I just want to say something to mum and dad on this subject, now that you've raised it to the mums and dads. Is that all right? Yes. Um, just something I want to say generally about anger. How do you, a lot of people say to me quite often, um, they say, you know, ask me about their emotions and, and I say, well, actually, you're quite angry. And they say, no, no, I don't feel angry. And, and, and I wanted to give you some ideas or tools into how to know that you're angry. All right? When we're in a state of anger, so I'll just draw a column, in fact, here. Yeah. When I'm in a state of anger, it's very, very different to a state of love. When I'm in a state of anger, I want to destroy things. So you notice, not many people make a glass when they're angry. But lots of people have thrown a glass around and broken one when they're angry, right? <laughs> Because in our state of anger, we want to destroy. We want to actually, we have this intent to destroy. When we're in a state of love, we have an intent to do the opposite. We have an intent to create. Right? Now, when I say destroy and create, I'm not just talking about physical destruction or creation. I'm also talking about emotional destruction or creation. See, when we're in a state of anger, we want to emotionally crush others. Right? We have this feeling that we want to emotionally harm somebody. Uh, you know, and we can f you can feel it inside of yourself sometimes when it's there, can't you? Where somebody has hurt you, let's say. Somebody's done something damaging to you. What do you want to do in return? You want to do something damaging to them in return, to make them feel the pain you feel. That is an act of destruction. Every time I'm in an act of destruction, I'm in my anger. Remember, my anger covers over, so here's my anger. My anger covers over my fear, and my fear covers over my grief. Right? So, whenever I notice myself or anyone around me wanting to destroy, that's an easy way of seeing whether I'm, I or they are in a state of anger. So many people on, on the internet are saying at the moment that they love me, me personally. But at the same time, they want to destroy everything that I'm creating. So do they love me? No. If I wanted to destroy, let's say you were building a house and I didn't like the way your house looked. And so every brick you put on, I decided I was going to take it off. And as you're building your house, I come along and eventually I don't like the house. You eventually finish the house and I get, I come in at night and wire it up with explosives and blow it up. So you come along in the morning and it's all destroyed. Do you feel that you've been loved? In that? Of course not, right? Because you're not being allowed to create what you want to create. Now, it doesn't matter whether the person's creation is actually in error or in truth. If you have the feeling you want to destroy that creation, you are the one out of harmony with love. Can you see that? So, somebody could be getting a bulldozer, and this applies to the, the sanctuary, somebody could be getting a bulldozer and knocking down every single tree in the sanctuary, and the moment you get angry about it, you are now out of harmony with love and you are now in the mode of wanting to destroy. 
And you don't just want to destroy the trees, you want to destroy the person who destroyed the trees. Now, who's in a worse state of love now? The person who destroyed the trees or the person who wants to destroy the person who destroyed the trees? Can you see? You see, every time we're in a state of destruction, and I'm talking specifically here soul to soul emotional destruction. Right? Every time I have a soul feeling that I want to tear down what somebody else is creating, and it doesn't matter whether what they're creating, it doesn't matter whether what they're creating is harmonious or disharmonious with love. The instant I have a feeling inside of myself that I want to destroy it, I am now out of harmony with love. And I'm actually in a state of anger, which is actually covering over huge fears of my grief that I have about that act. So, if somebody comes into the sanctuary and just bulldozes the entire place, right, when you got there, if you felt about it, would you feel grief or anger? anger. Now, if you feel anger, then you're in a state of wanting to destroy and you're actually out of harmony with love. What we would want to do is feel our grief. So you'd go there to the property, look at it all getting destroyed, and you'd just sit down on the ground and just sob your heart out. That's what you would do. Does that make sense? If you're in a state of love, you would do that. When I say if you're in a state of love, that's more love than being in a state of anger. If you're in a complete state of love, when you're at one with God and somebody bulldozes the property, you won't even cry at all nor will you get angry and nor will you be afraid. You just won't do any of those things. Because when you're in a complete state of love where you've released all of your own emotions about all of these damaging things that occur external to yourself, you'll realise that you'll be able to create what was lost in an instant. So do you think you're going to worry about what was lost? Of course you won't. So can you see once you become at one with God, you won't have this feeling in you of wanting to destroy. So every time you have this feeling in you of wanting to destroy and particularly wanting to destroy something that someone else has created, then you need to look at what's going on inside of themselves emotionally. Does that make sense? And a lot of people say, oh, I love them so much, but I'm going to do whatever it takes to destroy what they're creating. Now, I've had a lot of people saying that to me recently, that they feel that whatever I'm creating is harmful to the world and they're going to spend as much as they, time as they possibly can to destroy what I'm creating. Wait, if you just created it again, wouldn't they come and bulldoze it again? Well, that might be true, but why do they want to bulldoze it in the first place? Because of their anger. Because of their anger. So I'm suggesting to them that what they need to do is they need to feel their anger. And then they need to go into why they're so afraid of me. Why do they have to be afraid of somebody who's never going to hurt them? So there's something going on in there for them, you see. And in there will be a lot of grief. Now for a lot of people for the moment, for me, it's a lot of grief that their belief systems are being confronted. You see, what happens is when your belief system becomes confronted, what happens to you? You then go through this process of feeling like, I want to hold on to this belief system. Or, why do we want to hold on to a belief system? Because in the end it supports us emotionally somehow. So, and, and if I get into a state of wanting to hold on to a belief system and instead be willing to destroy the other person and what they've created, then straight away I'm out of harmony with love. So the truth is that I don't want to... If I could just turn that microphone off for a sec though. The truth is that I don't want to. Um, it was just that heavy breathing was doing something to me. <laughs> and if I don't want to, I don't want to destroy religions. A lot of people feel that's what I want, but that's not what I want. What I would like is for every single religion on the planet to actually just accept the loving truth. Now, if that happened, every single religion on the planet could exist. It would exist in different forms, of course, than what they currently exist because many of their current teachings are based on unloving actions. But I don't want to destroy the religions or the, or the organisations that created them. What I want to see is for, I want to create 
lo the loving truth inside of them, every single one of them. I don't want to destroy politics. I want to create the loving truth inside of it all. When, it, when that's created, everything will start coming together. Does that make sense? I don't want to destroy your faith. I want to make sure that your faith is based on truth. That's what I would like to do. Does that make sense to everyone? So if you have ever feeling, a feeling inside of you that you want to destroy somebody or something, there is actually a word for that. Whoops. There's actually a word for that. And uh, it's hate. All right? And a lot of times we don't own up to the fact that we are in a state of hatred. And it's something that we need to learn to own up to if we really want to progress towards love. I don't want to hate anything or anyone, even those who want to hate me. I don't want to hate them. But I do want to live in love and truth. The instant that I am angry with a person who hates me, I am out of harmony with love and truth. Do you see that? And so that's something for me that I have to work through then if that's the case. So that was just an aside because it's so important to understand that when you're angry, you're actually often in a place of destruction. All right. And it's a very damaging place to relationships and to the world, in fact, being in a place of wanting to destroy things around you. Anyway, back to the chits. Any more questions? What time is it? We only got a few more minutes now, so. Have we had lunch? No, we haven't had lunch. Didn't. Yeah, it <laughs> just went like that, didn't it? Uh, I got my class. <laughs> Far away. If we like get hurt, but it just like appears, uh, are we not feeling any emotion? Sorry, if you get hurt. And it just appears you don't actually do something wrong. Uh, we're not feeling any emotion. That's correct. So let's say, um, see, see my thumb here. Can you see my thumb? See how it's gone all cracked and all funny? Yes. Right. See this thumb? It's not like that, is it? No. No. So actually, that happened by itself. I didn't injure it or anything like that. That happened by itself. But the fact that it's happening means there must be an emotion inside of me that I'm denying to feel. So every time I try and shut down an emotion inside of myself, what's going to happen is there's something on my body that's going to hurt. And that's happening to me all the time. So there's different things I shut down and my body hurts the ear and whatever. So what I try to do now is I look at that. So I've been looking at that and I, mm, I know what that's all about. And that's all about how much I don't love myself at the moment. And it's all about some emotions that I have about not being the same as I used to be. So you know a lot of the questions that you ask that I couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. Well, I could answer them where, if it, when I was before, but now I can't. And I feel really sad about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So it's a bit like you losing half your memory and then you feel like, oh boy, I used to be, I used to know that and I used to know this and now I don't know it. And so I feel a lot of, fear, I feel a lot of um, sadness about that. And that's what's caused my thumb to go like, you feel that, it's really strange, hey? Yes. See how hard it is? Which I get sores and I don't really injure them a lot of times. Well, if you get sores too, remember a lot of our sores when we're little are based around our mum and our dad, right? So something that happens to our skin that just pops up by itself is an emotion often that we have, but often it's the emotion our mum and dad have as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you talk to your mum and dad about it and, and they feel their feelings about it, a lot of times the sore will disappear. So I've had that happen quite a lot. Now you got the question? Um, uh, when did you first like, think that you were Jesus in the first century? In the first century? Yeah. Um, I was about 19 years of age. Right. Yeah. And what about in this life? Just In this life I was... Um, 30, I was 39. Um, and how did that, like, how did you first come to that? How do you, like, think that you were Jesus in the first century at the first time? 
The first time was harder than this time because this time was like remembering things. Mm. So that, that's been a lot easier in a way. The yeah. first time was hard because I wasn't called... Jesus was just a name that anybody had, right? Yeah. It was a common name. And, and uh, when you ask the question about the first century, it's about being the Messiah or what's called the person who's going to be able to teach the truth to the world, if you like, mm. right? And that took me a long time to work out because what I eventually, I knew about this Messiah coming from all these Bible prophecies and everything and I investigated them all when I was younger than you actually, I started investigating them and I was gotten taught them and everything and then I started reading a lot of, you know, you've heard of the mediums or yeah. prophets? Yeah. When the, I started reading a lot of prophets or mediums of what they had said about the coming of the Messiah and and then I started realising what this Messiah was all about. It was going to be all about learning about love and all yeah. about God's laws of love and things mm -hmm. like that. And then I started realising that nobody I'd met actually knew about all of that. And you had the qualities? And, and I realised that, that, that it seemed to be only me that knew. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then I went through lots and lots of big emotions because I felt it couldn't be me. You know how, you know, you might have a certain gift and then you think, oh, why do I have it? Like, yeah. So I, I went through that and, and it took me seven years to work through that. So mm. from the time of 19 through to when I was 26, that's how long it took me to work through all, believing that it was me. So you sense? just realised that you had all the things that it said he would have or something? Yeah, that's what happened in the end. I started realising that I knew about all of these things and I seemed to have this special connection with God that nobody else had. Mm. And I couldn't understand it because I knew everyone could have it. Yeah. I knew it wasn't unique to me. I mean, everyone could do it. But I just didn't understand what, like that nobody, why anybody didn't have it. But I, it took me seven years to work through all of that. Like, and then eventually I worked through the, that I was that person, but I still had more work to do. And that's why people don't know much about me until I was 30 in the first century. Um, and do you, when, if you're in the spirit world, do you like, um, when, what sphere do you have to be in to choose to come back to earth? You have to be in the 22nd sphere. Right. Yeah. But you, a lot of them don't want to come back to earth. Yeah. Because why would you want to, like... So most people just come back because they see something that they need to do? Well, the ones who decided to come back first, the seven souls or 14 people who decided to come back first, mm. they came back because they wanted to teach people on the earth how to love again, like yeah. what, what divine love was all about. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah. And Mary might want to answer some of that too. She's right behind you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Is that understandable, though? Yeah. Yep. No worries. Uh, okay, you can hear me. Um, what's it called? Is there any point doing schooling? Because. <laughs> Well, most people know that I'm a radical, so... Because it isn't the best thing that's ever happened, I must say. But is it, does, well, is it needed in the changes that are happening over the world and all this? Is it, like, required in the next few when, years? Whenever I look at a question like that, I go for what's happening in the spirit world. And the truth is there is schools happening in the spirit world, but not anything like the schools that are happening here on Earth. They're totally different. In the spirit world, what happens is the children decide what they want to study and they actually create their environment to study and then they study the things they want to study. So in other words, if that was applied here on earth, the children would actually build the school that they want, exactly how they want it. They'd design it and build it. And then in that school, they would study exactly the things they want to study. Right? And it wouldn't be based, it's not based on a uh, grading system or anything like that in the spirit world. It's based on your passion. What is your passion? Recognizing your passion. Unfortunately, today on the planet, a lot of people suppress their passion. And a lot of school does, that's what a lot of school does too, doesn't it? Like, you really, like, you might be really into computers, but you only get one lesson a week. You know, or you might be really into biology, but you only get two lessons a week. Um, the rest of the lessons about English and all these other things they say you have to learn. But 
the best way to learn is to have a passion and then learn everything about that particular thing to make it easier to learn. So for example, there is a lot of mathematics, for example, in biology. Right? And there's a lot of chemi chemistry in biology. And if we wanted to focus on biology, for example, as, a, as an area of study, we would have to learn chemistry and mathematics and quite a number of other principles in the whole process. But we'd do it because we want to do it and not because some, so, somebody's forcing it down our throat. So the short answer is, I don't feel there's much worth in schooling at all at the present, right? right. And uh, why are you pointing at <laughs> Say why are you are pointing? Oh, I don't, oh. Um, I don't know. Mum's I trying just, to convince you otherwise. Oh, well, sort of, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you feel mum is. What do you feel? Um, she's, allowed to, she's allowed to have her own feelings and you're allowed to have yours. Well, I've always had an idea that we should be able to learn everything gradually, yep. not having to go to school. We should just want to learn what we want to learn and then develop in those areas instead of learning a large variety of different things and branching off into whatever when we get to uni. Yeah. But, and mum has always wanted me to go to school and I'm not like, well, I'm smart, but I'm not the top. Yeah. I'm going to a school called Queensland Academy of Health Sciences. So I'm smart, but I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. So my feelings are quite different to what the average parent's feelings are. And my feelings are when you find your passion, as a parent, my role is to help you find your passion. And then once you find your passion, my role is to try and help you achieve your passion. A lot of times, though, what happens as parents is we, we, we actually provide everything in a physical way to our children. So we finish up not teaching our children how to how to actually cook, how to clean, and do you know how to cook for yourself <coughs> completely? Yeah, very, quite well actually. Okay, so that's fantastic, right? Now many parents don't even teach that to their children. Uh, most children, by the most boys by the time they're 16 have got no idea how to cook, right? Or how to, how to do the ironing. I'm having trouble with the ironing. Okay, right. <laughs> All that kind of stuff, right? And, and so they're, they're, now, now there's obviously things involved in that, like, which is an issue of self-esteem. Does that make sense? Like, if I really want to look after myself, then I will want to look after my person, and that looking after that person is going to mean I want to cook for that person, this person here. Yeah. I want to clean for this person here, because I love myself. So a lot of times, though, as parents, we teach our children to become dependent upon us as parents, which is a very damaging thing to do. Right? But we also teach them to try, teach our children to fit into society because we have these deep emotional injuries inside of ourselves when we didn't fit into society and what happened to us in our lives as a result of it. So for many of us as parents, we have these deep feelings inside of us of like this terrible feeling that our child's not going to fit into society, our child's not going to succeed, our child's not going to... And we get into this terrible panic inside of ourselves, <coughs> right? And then we start imposing upon our children our rules rather than actually allowing our children to learn things God's way, which is a very symbiotic way, which is what you've described. So my feelings are um, schools will exist, but not in the form that we currently have them, where you're forced to go. But then again, if you don't go, you will also be asked to look after yourself and instead of having your parents look after you. Does that make sense? Like, so for, instance, for example, is it right for me to expect you to provide my food if I'm not willing to provide my food for myself? No. No, it wouldn't be loving, would it, for, to, for me to expect you to do it? Quite often as children, though, we grow up being taught that our parents will do it, and we get to age like 16, 17 or whatever, and we still expect them to keep doing it, and, but we don't want to go to school, we don't want to go to uni, we don't want to do all these other things, but then again we don't want to work for ourselves and do all of those things either. So I feel there are a lot of things that can be learnt with the child taking complete responsibility for their own life right from a very early age. And unfortunately the way the laws are constructed on the planet, that's not even allowed in many cases. So you know, how many 12-year-old how many children are allowed to work if they wanted to work? No, it's pretty hard to find a job if you're a 12-year-old nowadays. 
um, if you wanted to find that job. Not, not being influenced by your parents, but you wanted it. And so my feelings are, in the end, there will probably not be any schools like there currently is, but there will certainly be large institutions like universities and schools that are created through the desire of the students banding together and wanting to create something in a certain way for whatever reasons. Some of them will be positive and some of them won't even be positive. And that's fine in the end because that's what you're allowed to do. So um, I feel forcing a child to go to school is very damaging to, to the child. Yeah. The main reason why most parents continue to force their children to go to school is because they're afraid of the system and what's going to happen to the parent if they stop forcing their child to go to school. Well, I don't mind going to school. It's actually good hanging out with friends and all yep. that. But uh, should, we, should we be learning something else instead of the basic math, science, physics, um, music? You should be learning what you have a passion to learn. Okay. And, and then incorporating math, science and physics into that, passion. into that passion. So, for example, let's say I wanted to build a house. Right? So I start off with nothing. So we could easily teach this in schools from a very young age, what I'm going to just illustrate here. Let's say a child, like an eight-year-old child, six-year-old child wants to build a house. There's no reason. Why. Like we were talking to some children the other day. How old is Adam? He'd be 10, 12. Um, he wants to build his own house. Right? So he doesn't want to live with mum and dad. He wants to live near mum and dad in his own house. So, he, so how many of your parents would be severely emotionally challenged with that? <laughs> like many of you would be, right? But he wants to live in his own house near mum and dad. He doesn't want to live with mum and dad. So, so what we started doing is we started talking to him about the principles of building from a, from a, you know, from a mathematical uh, point of view. And we talked about this whole principles of adobe, you know, the building with, with the land, building with soil, building with um, uh, structures that, that can maintain... Uh, themselves even under lots of severe stress and pressure. And we started talking about how, you know, like curve, curve structures, for instance, curve structures like that, uh, if they're supported on the ends, can, can actually withstand huge amounts of forces. And a curve structure like that, for example, will survive a, a cyclone or a, or a tornado much easier than a square structure like that will. Right? And we started talking too about how square structures today are built from milled wood or steel, a lot of them, and concrete, whereas these kind of structures can be built from the earth, from clay, sand, and all these kind of things that would withstand even more pressures than these will. And then we started talking about the science involved in it and the mathematics involved in it, because he wants to build a house. Right? So we started, started talking about how to make something have a square, for example. There's whole rules of Pythagoras in that, isn't there, in terms of... How do you actually do that in practice? Make a square on the ground, for example. How do you make it level using water? So you don't have actually a spirit level. You only have a water. You don't have water. How do you make this thing level on the ground? You know, so that you put, you put something circular at the top and it doesn't roll down somewhere in the building. There's all these mathematical principles that can all be incorporated into this young man Adam's desire to build this house of his own. And I would be encouraged, I would, I would encourage him not to go to school, but rather to do everything he can possibly do to learn about how to build this structure. And he built it. He actually built the house. And he could easily, by the time he's 13, have a house built for himself. And on top of that, have learnt all of these rules of mathematics that he would normally earn, learn in first and second year high school. Yeah. And that's how it would be in the future, I feel. And when you've got groups of children doing this, so you imagine this is a now larger structure and groups of children doing this, the children can actually do all of this and that all the teacher does is guide the process. That's all, all that needs to happen. <laughs> she tries to, she's trying to take it away from you. <laughs> a woman trying to take something away from you. That's a law of attraction event. <laughs> Related to your mother too, by the way. <laughs> we, know that one. we know that one, yeah. Um, well, next topic, I guess. Um, is it 
Well, not to like, I'm planning on doing this, but is it okay to kill someone if they're doing really bad things to other people and killing other people? Is it like their karma or something or whatever? And the question I always ask is, that, does God kill them? So if they're killing other people, does God just step in and kill them? Doubt it. We've never seen it happen, right? Where God has just gone lightning strike to that person who's just <laughs> killed someone else. That doesn't happen. So, so the truth is that God doesn't kill them, but kill a person who kills someone else. So when you're at one with God, you won't either. In other words, it doesn't matter how bad another person is treating you, as soon as you step out of love, you are now just have, you now have just reduced yourself to the same kind of person. And it's a very important principle to remember. And if everyone on the planet knew it, there would be no problem. But then a person goes, well, hang on a sec though. The people who want to hurt me are going to be in worse condition all the time than me. But you see, what we're doing oftentimes is we're not taking into account all of God's laws. Here on earth, one of the major problems we have is we think we get away with things. Right? And if we were taught from the youngest age possible that... God, from, God's, from God's perspective, we don't ever get away with anything, then there'd be far less inclination to try and get away with things even if nobody knew about them. Right? But the truth is that, yes, um, people do choose to kill other people. That's what corporal punishment's all about. But it's actually very damaging to the soul. So my suggestion is to not do it. Yeah. And rather feel your emotions about uh, other people hurting people, firstly, and then stand up for truth in those situations. So in other words, I'm perfectly happy to stand in front of someone with a knife who wants to kill someone else, but I'm not happy to actually get out a gun and shoot him. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, like I wasn't planning to. But no, like, no. It's a yeah. good question, though. It's an ethical question. The majority of people on the planet have a lot of difficulty with this question because we feel that there is always a righteous justification for violence. And from God's perspective, there is no righteous justification for any violence, including anger towards another person. doesn't matter what the other person has done, there is no justification for your response out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's how I've lived my life, in the first century in particular, that's how I lived my life. It resulted in my death. But you imagine if everyone on earth lived their life that way, there'd be no death on earth as a result. So in the end, we've all got to somehow like, aspire to that ideal and deal with our emotions if we can't. So what, what would be my emotions if I can't do it? I'm afraid of death. I'm afraid of my children dying, I'm afraid of my wife dying, I'm afraid of being harmed permanently, I'm afraid that somehow I'll be destroyed inside of myself. But they're all just fears because they're not real. The truth is you can't die. Even if your body dies, you can't die. You will continue living. You'll have a better life or just as good a life in the spirit world as what you're having now. So at the end of the day, there is really no point to death. And once people start understanding that as well, then there's really no point in killing anybody. Right. Next topic, or we've got some From else? far away? Yeah, um, I know that's going to sound like a bit, well, un, um, how would I say, um, under worry. my age type thing. Don't yeah. worry about what anything uh, is. Mythical like. creatures. Sorry? Mythical creatures. A lot of mythical creatures are actually spirit creatures. Um, so they actually exist. Um, so mythical creature, say some of them. Dragon, minotaur. Yep. There are dragons that exist in the spirit world. Right? So they are creatures that exist in the spirit world that have since passed from the earth and also that have not lived on this earth but lived on other planets that are now in the spirit world and have become a part of our myths and legends because nobody wants to accept that they're real. You see, what becomes a part of our myths and legends are the things that we deny in reality. Uh, 
And this is, a, this is a, a, a something to understand generally, is that a lot of times what happens is that we get myths and other kinds of teachings because that, that, we, that are a part of sort of folklore, if you like, that, we, that become a part of our entertainment system, if you like. And the reason why they happen is because we're actually avoiding the reality of them. All right? And that's something to bear in mind. So yes, a lot of those creatures that you've mentioned uh, and others are all existing in the spirit world. They don't exist here, but they do exist in the spirit world. And by the way, you can create them in the spirit world. So in other words, you can learn how to create an animal and ask God to, once you're in a certain state of love, and ask God to actually infuse that animal with life and you'll have created a living creature. And you can do that in the spirit world. And eventually we'll be doing that here and we'll show you how to do that here. Yeah. Um, okay, when Rome fell, the, the Dark Ages followed and a lot of knowledge was lost when Rome fell with all the Greeks and what they passed down and Rome copied and all that. But how many times has that happened over the past millennia, I guess? Um, are there lots of past civilizations that have just fallen out because of dark ages and have to restart and all that? Yeah, and historically through, the, through t tens of thousands of years, there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of civilizations that mankind know nothing about as a result. And often mankind attribute things of creation that have been created to different civilizations that actually created them. For instance, th there is a whole series of pyramids, right? For instance, in Egypt, some of them were created by the people they thought created them, but the Great Pyramid was not. And so there's a whole, s there's a whole, you know, thought, there's a whole thoughts here on, on the earth about who created what that are not uh, actually harmonious with the truth either. In the spirit world, there's records of all of these things. And so you can actually read about all of the actual cultures that created these different things and where those cultures exist. And in fact, there are a lot of those cultures are actually under the sea now. And that's why man doesn't know about them is because the, the earth's crusts fell and with it took away the entire culture in one, in one event. And uh, those events happen on a cyclic period. And so during these cycles that occur, these 26,000 and 13,000 year cycles that occur, there's whole civilizations that have been destroyed and man's never found them. And the reason why man's never found them is because they are deep under the sample of, um, or, or under the sea. And, uh, and in future we'll see some of them because some of those places will rise and you'll actually see them and know that they existed from the past. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, it's time for a break, I think, isn't it? And then we'll open things up to parents, all right? Thanks, guys. Thanks for the children, for their questions. Yes, um,